Okay, so it's wonderful to uh, be back with you to learn about some of our early Zionist uh, friends. Uh, and just a reminder that we'll pick up next week at the same time. Uh, next week is, I think, at least from my perspective, my favorite uh, unit of this section, uh, with one possible exception, but uh, we're going to be learning uh, next week about Herzl. So uh, always a pleasure to, uh, to think about and learn about uh, Herzl. Uh, so please join us uh, next week. But before we do, I want to turn our attention this week to a man called Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch uh, Kalisher. Okay, and you could think of him sort of in parallel to uh, Rabbi Huda Alkali, who we studied last week. And uh, in a lot of ways, Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher uh, might be described as kind of the Ashkenazic equivalent of uh, Rabbi Huda Alkali. Um, sadly, uh, they, they didn't know about each other uh, until late in their lives. Um, and uh, there's something sort of fascinating about looking at them and thinking about them comparatively and noticing that they arrived at so many of the same ideas in different geographic and cultural uh, settings. You know, one is in Zamun and like uh, Serbia and, you know, the other is like uh, just smack in the middle of, uh, you know, then Prussia, now Poland. Um, and, and somehow they're absorbing um, a lot of the same, a lot of the same uh, notions about uh, nationalism and about self-determination that we'll speak more about in, uh, in just a moment. And at some point um, they did, uh, they did find each other. Okay, so who is Svi Hirsch uh, Kalischer? So let's talk a little bit about his uh, biography, and then we'll look a little more uh, in depth at his, uh, at his work, um, at his philosophy, and his legacy, what he contributed to the Zionist, uh, to the Zionist idea. So Kalischer was born um, in Lisa, in the Prussian province of, uh, of Posen, which is now uh, Lezno uh, in Poland. Um, and uh, he was always uh, destined for the uh, for the rabbinate, uh, and he was uh, he was educated by um, two very very prominent Gedoli Israel. Uh, one was Rabbi Akiva Eger, uh, whom uh, we've all uh, heard of, um, and the second was uh, a man whose whose name is a little less well known to us, but uh, you know in the base medrash everybody studies his sefer, the Baal Hanasivos, Rav Yaakov of Lisa. So the Ktsosa Choshen is one of the most important books of, uh, of Lamdus um, in, uh, in uh, the base Medrash uh, for, anyone, uh, for anyone doing uh, serious learning. And then Sivos is, the, is the, the one who takes on the Ktsosa and they duke it out and you can get into like the, the depths of, uh, of Pilpul uh, when you learn the, the Ktsosa and the, uh, the Nesivos. So the author of the Nesivos is this uh, rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov Elisa. Um, and he was the teacher of Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher. I'll just put in for, um, uh, in a parenthesis, that Rabbi Yaakov Elisa was also the great grandson of the, uh, the Chacham Tzvi. So it always comes back to, uh, to the Chacham Tzvi. So he was the teacher of uh, Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher. Um, and after uh, a marriage in, uh, uh, in Lisa, he settled in the town of uh, Torn, T H O R N. Uh, it's a city on the Vistula River, which was then in Prussia, and now I think the town is spelled T-O-R-U-N in northern uh, Poland. That's where Copernic Copernicus lived, obviously not in the same uh, in the same century, and that is where uh, Tzvi Hirsch Kalischer spent the the rest of his life. Okay, so I'll just put on the uh, on the screen, and you have it in your source sheet. That's one of the only photos that we have uh, very late in life of Tzvi Hirsch Kalischer. And here's a map just so you could situate yourself. Okay, so this is present day. Uh, this is present day uh, Poland, um, and you can sort of see we're uh, in between uh, Poznan and Warsaw, a little north of, uh, of Warsaw, um, and obviously way, way west of, uh, of Bialystok, you know, uh, decidedly in, uh, in Ashkenaz. So um, he becomes the, uh, the rabbi of this, uh, of this very small community. Uh, there's probably a few hundred Jews. I don't think we have the exact numbers, but uh, it's a state of a few hundred Jews uh, living in this uh, in this city, um, in this city called Torn. Okay, uh, he never took a salary um, to the extent that he ever earned any money or people made gifts or tried to sponsor him. 
So he always donated it to whatever cause was supporting uh, Palestine. Um, uh, we weren't calling it Zionism. It's a little anachronistic to call it Zionism in this moment, but retrospectively, uh, you know, it was uh, it was the pre-Zionist uh, cause. So um, it's not really clear to me. And one source, you know, uh, something about his being independently wealthy, and another source, uh, his wife ran a small business and supported him. Either way you slice it, uh, he uh, was taken up with uh, with his rabbinic um, responsibilities and later with his uh, pro, pro and proto-Zionist responsibilities without ever really having to worry about how to uh, make ends meet. Okay, as we talked about last week with respect to Yehuda Alkali, the influence of nationalism was, uh, was all around. Again, so you look at the 19th century map, so who's vying for their national uh, independence and autonomy? So it's the Italians and the Greeks and the Hungarians and the Poles. So, you know, everyone is putting forward this notion that we can be our own independent uh, people. And, and again, there's a conversation to be had uh, around the question of what constitutes a people. Is it geography? Is it language? Is it culture? Is it heritage? Is it history? We'll return to that a little more uh, next week. But you know, certainly, geography is playing a role for uh, for all these nations. You know, we're not just uh, you know Venetians; we're Italian, and there's a sense of uh, of uh, nationhood and nationalism which is brewing, uh, which is brewing all around. So, as early as 1836, okay. Uh, Sviersh Kalisher was born in 1795, so uh, he's a man in his uh, early 40s. Um, as early as 1836, he was dreaming of a return to, uh, to Zion. Okay, and he actually wrote to uh, a man who was one of the wealthiest and most prominent Jews of his day, uh, Asher Anshel Rothschild, suggesting that uh, he buy Jerusalem from Muhammad Ali. Okay, Muhammad Ali, not the, uh, not the boxer. Um, it was, um, I, I mentioned it just because it, it reminds us a little, and we'll talk about Herzl next week, it reminds us a little of kind of the, the brazenness and the, the kind of uh, chutzpah that uh, one could suggest that we could just kind of flip a switch and uh, make something happen that would precipitate a mass movement from, uh, from Europe or from the Ottoman Empire to, uh, to Palestine. We have no record of Rothschild ever even answering this, uh, this correspondence. But again, uh, you could sort of see the seeds being planted. We're gonna need big, bold ideas. And a lot of people are gonna say no, eventually somebody's gonna say yes, and we'll move, and we'll move the, uh, uh, the needle one, one step at a time. Okay, I'll also say a little parenthetically that, um, you know, in the in the 21st century, uh, we're less sensitive to this because uh, there's not a, a a battle, there's not a current battle between denominations or among denominations um, in our community. So on our block, there's a the Orthodox shul. On the next block, there's a Reform shul, and uh, it doesn't bother anyone. We're not fighting with them. You know, they have their community, and we have our community. And they'll do some things themselves, and we'll do some things ourselves, and sometimes we'll get together. So in 19th century, um, there there were battle lines, okay, and everyone was engaged in this battle for the soul and the future of the Jewish people, and everyone is uh, is recruiting, and everyone is trying to uh, figure out a path uh, path forward. So this is the age of emancipation and enlightenment and reform says, you know, we don't need to be uh, held back by the yoke of uh, obligation and mitzvot and Torah. We can acculturate and we can be modern citizens of the world and we'll also be Jewish, you know, with some Jewish, uh, Jewish identification. And obviously the Orthodox and the traditionalists are fighting tooth and nail to retain the traditions of the, uh, uh, of the past. Okay, so by definition, if you're a traditionalist, you're anti-reform and vice versa. So I'll just point out as a kind of a sidebar, but it, it has important resonances for the next, let's say, 100 years, thinking about, you know, the 1830s, 1840s. So Kalischer was not just against the reform Jewish movement because he was a traditionalist, but he saw reform as a movement which was, by definition, almost anti 
Zionist, and again, he wasn't using that term, but was opposed to the notion that Jews should ever have any interest in returning to Palestine. Okay, I'll just share with you one excerpt from something he wrote. I didn't put this on the source sheet, but he said what the children of Israel were saying to Moses on the eve of the deliverance at the Red Sea was that at that stage, it would be far better for them to be free men in Egypt. What did they need another country for? Right, the, all the Sefer Bamidbarts, uh, you know, the Israelites always saying to Moshe, "Why'd you take us out? We should, we would have been better off in in Mitzrayim." Today, too, Kalisher writes, "Today, too, when Jews obtain equal rights in the exile, they no longer contemplate going to Eretz Israel. On the contrary, there's a stigma attached to the ideas. They say, here is Eretz Israel. They do not perceive the works of the Lord and the power of His holiness.'" which will be made manifest in the Holy Land. And there's much more to say about this, but it was one of the uh, most prominent planks of the reform platform, the sense that, you know, fill in the blank, Berlin is the new Jerusalem, Pittsburgh is the new Jerusalem, you know, whatever decade we're, uh, we're talking about. So they excised from the liturgy all mention of Korbanos and a return to Zion and a rebuilding of Jerusalem, those are all gone, okay? It wasn't until the 1950s that reformed Jews finally turned the corner and said, you know what, maybe Zionism isn't such a bad idea after all, okay? So it's just fascinating to think about and to recognize this history. Um, and it's so almost ironic that in the 21st century, you know, Israel is one of the last things that the reform movement holds on to, but it was actually one of the first things that it jettisoned um, in, the, uh, uh, in the 19th century. <laughs> Dream of going back to Palestine? Who needs Palestine? We're at home right here. And again, as I mentioned last week, um, you know, Palestine was a backwater. There's just a few thousand Jews there, it's uh, malaria infested and nobody can make a living. And uh, you know who, who wants to be there? The weather's terrible. You can't make anything grow. There's not enough water. There's no irrigation. So uh, it, you know, this fanciful thing of returning to Zion. So the reform said, it, it, it's not just a bad idea. It's, it's counter to everything we're going for. We're trying to move forward and to be emancipated and to be acculturated and to be absorbed into the you know, 19th uh, century uh, high society. And you, Zionists, again, anachronistically, you're going backward to a land that can't be built up and is nothing to do with modernity. And, and it, like, what, what are you holding on to? We've already gotten there. We've arrived. Why would you want to, why would you want to go back? Already in the 1830s, um, and again, we'll circle back and amplify this in a minute, but already in the 1830s, um, the Tzvi Hirsch Kalischer began a correspondence which became quite famous, a correspondence with the Chassam Sofer and, uh, and Rebbe Akiva Eger, um, two of the greatest uh, Hungarian uh, postkim of, uh, of their generation. Uh, a correspondence with the two of them about the reintroduction of Korbanos. So Tzvi Kalisher said, why don't we reinstitute uh, Korbanos? You know what we could do? We could, uh, we could go back to, uh, we could go back to Israel and uh, we'll go right up to the Temple Mount. The fact that there's no temple shouldn't, uh, shouldn't stop us. We'll build a Mizbeach and we'll bring Korbanos. So we'll come back to this in a minute, but I'll just share with you a quote from, uh, from Yaakov Katz, the great uh, 20th century historian. He said that the implication of this correspondence was the possibility of a restoration of Jewish life in Israel without awaiting a miracle. So again, this wasn't a political plan. This wasn't a practical plan, but this was a conceptual religious plan that was being sort of duped out in the base medrash, so to speak, you know, in a halachic correspondence and response to literature to entertain the possibility, hey, what do you think halachically of the idea of bringing a korban in the 19th century? You know, and you can ask the same question. How about in 2022? Why not bring, uh, why not bring korbanos? What's stopping us? Okay, so again, we'll circle back to it in a second, but already you can see this sense in early in the career of Tzvirish Kalisher that the wheels are spinning and the thinking is we're not waiting for Mashiach, right? We can actually take destiny into our own hands 
and move the Jewish future ahead on our own. And you know, we 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 talk and we daven about a rebuilt Jerusalem. Let's rebuild it, right? Halachically speaking, let's put up a mizbeach and we'll bring and we'll bring korbanos. It sounds radical, um, and maybe it uh, maybe it was, um, but this uh, this correspondence was actually quite uh, quite fascinating um, and remains the sort of central uh, uh, source for anyone interested in entertaining this question, the back and forth between Svir Hesh Kalisher on the one hand and the Chassam Sofer and Rabbi Kiva Eger on the, uh, on the other. Okay. 1860, uh, Tzvi Hesh Kalisher holds what was functionally the first Zionist conference in the history of the world. And he gathered together whoever he could find, he invited his friends and his colleagues and uh, other rabbis to come and talk about what it would mean to go back to uh, Palestine. 1861, he formed something called the Society for the Colonization of, uh, of Palestine. In 1862, he published his most important work called Drishat Zion, okay, and we'll talk about that uh, in a couple minutes, where he lays out his plan for what a return to Palestine would, uh, would look like. It wasn't until 1863 that Alkali finally learned um, uh, that uh, Alkali finally learned of Kalisher and, uh, and vice versa, and they started to, uh, to correspond uh, with one another. In 1864, in Berlin, he founded something called the Central Committee of Societies for the Settlements of, uh, of Israel. And again, there's like a pre-Herzl, proto-Herzl um, phenomenon here. He wrote and he traveled and he preached and he fundraised and he did whatever he could to stir up interest in this dream of returning, of returning to Zion. So um, basically, as a function of his, uh, as a function of his ag agitation, the Alliance Israelite uh, Universelle founded something called Mikveh Israel, which was the first agricultural school in Palestine in 1870, right outside, if I remember my geography correctly, right outside of uh, of Cologne. And again, we'll circle back to this um, next uh, next week. Uh, Herzl visited uh, Palestine. You know how many times in his life? I'll give you a hint. It's the exact same number as the number of times that Rev. Joseph B. Soloveitchik visited Palestine in his life. Once, okay, Joseph B. Soloveitchik went, went uh, in 1935, still Palestine, um, to apply to be the chief rabbi of, uh, of Tel Aviv, didn't get the position. Herzl went once in 1898 um, to meet uh, the Kaiser, to meet Kaiser uh, Wilhelm. And where did he meet him? He met him in Mikveh Israel, the agricultural school founded in 1870 by none other than Tzvi Hirsch College. Okay. Um, at the very end of his life, uh, in around 1871, the Mikveh Israel Chevra invited him and said, why don't you come be the rub of our community? He was ready to go, but by that point, his, uh, his health was failing um, and uh, uh, he never made it. Um, he actually had a whole, like, uh, there was a goodbye correspondence, and he started writing to people and saying, I'm living my dream, and I'm moving to, to Palestine, um, and people sent him, uh, sent him gifts, and people sent him money, um, and he said, I'm not taking any of your money, I'm donating it to the, uh, I'm donating it to the cause, and in the end, he never uh, made it to, uh, to Palestine um, in the end of his life, uh, he passed away in, 18, uh, in 1874. So let me just say something about the works that he uh, contributed to uh, uh, to posterity. Um, so he was a massive Talmud Chacham, and uh, sometimes this gets missed because we always think of him as a pre-Zionist, a proto-Zionist, but he wrote very learned uh, works, which are still referenced uh, to this day in the base matters. He wrote a book called uh, Evan Bochan, which was a commentary on uh, on Choshen Mishpat. He wrote a book called Sefer Moznaim Mishpat, um, another Sefer on Choshen Mishpat, Tzvila Tzadik, uh, on Yoradea, Sefer Habrit, a commentary on the Torah, Sefer Yitzias Mitzrayim, a commentary on the Haggadah. He wrote Chidushim on several Masechtos of, uh, of Shas, and he contributed largely um, and regularly to, uh, to Hebrew magazines. I always make this, uh, this point. You get to the 19th century, so there's journals, and there's newspapers, and there's periodicals, and this becomes the, the you know, language of the learned, uh, the learned class. They're always, you know, writing articles and opinion pieces and uh, book reviews, and then they write letters to the editor, and they respond to each other, and you have these uh, correspondences which, uh, you know, transcend uh, geography and uh, cultural boundaries. So he contributed to Hamagid and Sion and Haivri and Halevanon, 
And again, all those journals, they're all digitized. They're all uh, accessible in your living room. You could uh, just go to the National Library of Israel uh, homepage. You could find any article you want from the 19th century from any of these periodicals. Some of them are in Hebrew, some of them are in French, some of them are Yiddish, some of them are in German, some of them are in English. And you could find uh, whatever you're looking for. It's really uh, extraordinary if you have a few extra minutes to, uh, to explore. Okay, so um, let me turn for a second to, uh, to Drishat Zion. Okay, Drishat Zion, uh, he published in, uh, in 1862. It's his, magnum, uh, it's his magnum opus. And he laid it out in, uh, in three parts. Um, the, first, uh, the first part, let me just take you through them so we have an understanding of what we're dealing with. Um, and what uh, what his you know principal contribution was to the history of Zionism. So in part number one of Drishat Zion, Kalisher uh, laid out his plan to create an agricultural society in Israel. And again, agriculture is very important. The notion of the Jews supporting themselves. They weren't going to get to Israel and set up uh, and set up uh, you know a, a shop to sell watches. They were going to work the land and uh, and earn a living as farmers. The, the sense was that uh, human efforts will help bring about uh, a redemption. Um, and amazing to compare this, uh, this language, but remember last week I shared with you an entire uh, excerpt from an essay that Yehuda Alkali wrote where he said, you know, tshuva, it's gotten misappropriated and the rabbis kept talking about tshuva as a notion of repentance and uh, clopping al chait. it's what you do before Yom Kippur. That's all fine and good, but tshuva at its core really means a return to the land. And if you go back to the Psukim, that's what it's all about. And Svirsh Kalisher said the same thing. Right? He said, if you want to know what tshuva is, go back to the Psukim and you'll understand that tshuva is about a return uh, to the land. Just to summarize sources uh, one and two on your, uh, on your sheets. So uh, I'll just uh, share with you a quick, uh, quick excerpt. Uh, excerpt um, which he actually didn't write in Drishat Zion, but he captured this uh, sentiment in Drishat Zion also. Um, he said, Hello, Yecheskel, Amr Beferish, it's Chila, Yel Yisrael Hamoshav, Miamim, Mikne, the Kinyan, the He Miamim, Hotsa, the Achrach Yavo Umago, the Achrach Yavo Mashiach. He said, First, you got to go back to the land and have a settlement and have some ownership and have some bylaws over the land of Israel. And then there'll be Gogu Magog, and then there'll be Mashiach, all the prophecies that uh, we, we read about in the Nevi'im. Those will come true, but first you got to go back to the land, not the other way around. The Eich Yavo Pitom, what you think is like Mashiach's just going to fall out of the sky. It's not going to happen in a flash. It's going to happen incrementally, and we have to start the process by returning uh, to the land. I have this for you in source number two. It says, do not think that God will suddenly send the Messiah from heaven to blow the great shofar to the scattered people of Israel and gather them to Jerusalem as promised through his servant. Certainly, all the words of the prophets will come to pass at the end of days, but not suddenly in one day. Rather, the redemption of Israel will come very slowly. The dawn of salvation will flower when Israel acts with courage and realizes all the aims and promises of the holy prophets. Step number one, return to Israel, build an agricultural society that's self-sustaining, and then we can precipitate the coming of the Messianic era. Part number two of Drishat Zion. He quoted uh, a whole uh, slew of Mamre Chazal about the centrality of Israel, right? So we looked at some of them last week, but, you know, the Gemara is at the end of Ksuvos that, uh, you know, if you live outside of Israel, it's like you have no, uh, no God and you have to, uh, you have to uh, live in Israel and there's only three excuses not to live in Israel. If you don't have one of those excuses, so you're living in sin. Bechule, 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 to convince any prospective reader that uh, Israel was the place to live and Israel was the place uh, uh, to be. Preempting the critics, right, who asked sort of the $64,000 question, which is, you know, if this whole logic is right and uh, we're supposed to go back to precipitate the return rather than wait for Mashiach before we go back, why hasn't anyone argued this in the past 1800 years, right? Uh, saying, uh, the, the Rambam also knew all the sources you quoted, and Rashi also knew all the sources you quoted, and Yosef Karo also. The, 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 they were smart. The, they knew all this uh, all this material. Why didn't they ever suggest, as you, Tzvi Hirsch Kalish, are suggesting that we return to Israel and bring the Messianic era by our own uh, by our own means? 
So preemptively, he wrote and said that um, in the past 1800 years, Jews had neither the means nor the influence to make this dream a reality. We're just running away from the Cossacks, right, to try to, you know, save our family. We think we're, we have the capacity to start buying land and talking to nobles and negotiating with diplomats. We're just trying to live in exile, like literally just trying to survive. So he says in the 19th century, emancipation, enlightenment, it's a new world and there's new opportunity. How could we not, how could we not take advantage? Source number three, um, he argues for the restoration of uh, Corbanos and he um, had collected already in the 1830s all of this correspondence uh, between him, between Kalischer and uh, Rabbi Kiva Eger and the Chassam Sofer, as, uh, as I mentioned. Um, and he publishes it and says, uh, you know, there's arguments both ways, and here's why we could, and here's why you might object, but here's an argument in favor of why we could reestablish the, uh, the institution of Korbanos in the, uh, uh, in the Holy Land. Okay, I'll just share with you. Um, because uh, this got published not just by Tzvir Shkalisher, but in the Shuvos of the Chassam Sofer uh, himself, okay? And he wrote, here's the title page, by the way, to uh, Trishat, uh, Trishat Zion, 1960, uh, 1862. Okay, and here's the Tshuva from, uh, from the Chassam Sofer, picking up in the middle. So, um, so let me just see if I can find, uh, find the right spot to, uh, to begin. Um, okay, so Rabbi Akiva Eger had written to the Chassam Sofer, his son-in-law, um, and said, what about, uh, what about this idea of bringing back the, uh, the Korbanos? It seemed like Rabbi Akiva Eger was, was actually uh, open to Tzvir Shkalisher's uh, suggestion, and he wrote to the Chassam Sofer and says, you know, you have some connections politically, maybe we could, we could ask and we could make it happen. And the Chassam Sofer says, um, you know, you asked me, Lavakesh, Misari, Yerushalayim, Liten, Rishus, Lakriv, Hu, Kaptan, Gadol. You asked me to, uh, uh, to make this request that maybe we could get permission to bring Korbanos. He says, Kiahu, Amar, Labali, Krav, Sham, Misha, Enu, Me'emunas, Ishmael. Kisham, Nibna, Beis, Avodah, Shalahem. V'yomrim, She'even, She'sia, Be'emtza, Hakipa, Ha'hi. V'lo, Yikrav, Sham, Ishzar, She'enu, Me'emunasam. He says, you know, there's one major uh, issue with your suggestion. The major issue with your suggestion is something called the Dome of the Rock, right? Why is it called the Dome of the Rock, by the way, right? So what's the rock? So the rock is this, uh, this Evan Shesia, right? The, the uh, foundation stone, right? That uh, is believed to be in that, uh, in that spot, right? And that's why it's holy both to uh, the Temple Mount for us and for, um, and for Muslims. So he says, it's a nice idea to go up to the Temple Mount and bring Korbanos, but I don't know if you noticed this, there's something called the, uh, you know, the, uh, the mosque, uh, the Dome of the Rock, and um, they're not going anywhere, and you're not allowed to go there unless you are practicing Islam, which we are not. So uh, you can have all the ideas you want about the restitution or the reinstitution rather of Korbanos, no way it's gonna happen as long as the Muslims are in control of the, uh, of the Temple Mount. Okay, so uh, putting, that, uh, putting that aside, um, you know, uh, Rav Kalisher uh, argued that uh, Jews should proactively buy land in, uh, in Israel. You know, the, his vision was that there'd be immigration from Eastern and Central uh, Europe and that the rest of the Jewish world should fund it by uh, supporting uh, those migrating Jews financially. Um, he envisioned a, uh, a formation of a militia for, uh, for defense. And as we talked about already, it was his dream to establish an agricultural school, um, a dream that actually came true when Mikvah Israel was opened in uh, uh, 18, uh, 1870. Okay, and he also, you know, said it's not just going to be good for the Jews, but it's going to be good for, uh, for everyone. I have this in source number four. He says, this will be the object of praise and glory in the eyes of the nations who will say that the children of Israel are people with the spirit to demand and renew the inheritance of their father. If the Italians and other people sacrifice themselves on behalf of their ancestral homeland, how much more so uh, a land like this, uh, which all the world regards as holy while we stand afar like a man who has no courage or heart. Okay, so if the Italians can rebuild Italy, 
and form a nation. Why can't Jews rebuild Palestine and form uh, and form a nation? Uh, it wouldn't just be any land. Everyone recognizes that it would be a holy land. Um, and uh, why should we be any worse than the Italians or the Hungarians or the Poles or anyone else who's vying for national independence in this uh, in this moment? Okay. And source number five, he echoes the sentiment. And he says, uh, we have enough examples of how other nations give of their possessions and their blood to recover land which was long lost to them. No sacrifice was too great to achieve their purpose. How much more for us Jews whose nation is so strongly connected to our holy religion should we fail in comparison with, uh, with other, na uh, other nations? Okay. Um, let me just say one or two more points and then I'll pause to ask uh, if there are any questions and then we'll sort of turn to the legacy and afterlife of Rav Tzvi Hirsch, uh, Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher. So just a couple of footnotes to the kind of philosophy of Rav Kalisher. He, he believed that Jewish nobles, and again, he has in mind, you know, of the world, the Rothschilds and Montefiore and Fold and Cremieux, um, he viewed them as divine agents. Their presence on the scene, just their very presence, the fact that the world had people like this in it, was evidence of God's role in human events. It can't be that there's a Jew with so much influence or so much potential influence that has to be part of a divine part of a divine plan. Okay. And the same went for uh, emancipation, right? He saw it as a kind of qualified good, mainly uh, an opportunity to advance a divine plan. He wasn't interested in what, let's say, the reform Jews were interested in, you know, equal rights and acculturation. He didn't care about that. He saw it as, you know, the potential end to Jewish oppression, which again, it wasn't either that, um, it wasn't that either, um, but, uh, but he saw it as, as a clarion call, as an opportunity to advance uh, a divine plan and return to, uh, to the land of our, uh, to the return to the land of our fathers. Okay, and he has in source number six, and again, like Alkali, he also was a Kabbalist, and he says, Val Yedei um, Isarusa, uh, mila tasa yavo isra'usa mila eila. There's this sense that, uh, you know, human efforts start the process and then God responds. If you do the work down below, God will respond from up above on, uh, on high. And again, the sort of the pre-Herzl notion of you can't just wait around. This isn't just going to, you know, fall out of the sky one day. If you want to bring about, uh, you know, something uh, you know, some positive change in the world, you have to, you have to uh, do the work to uh, bring it about yourself. It's going to happen through human agency. Hashem will help, but you have to start. Okay. And that's kind of the guiding principle or the guiding philosophy of this, uh, of this worldview espoused by uh, Tzvi Hirsch College. Okay, so let me just pause there and ask you if there are any questions or comments, and then I want to share something about his legacy. It seems to me that um, that there's there's a striking difference between Alkali and Kalisher on the one hand, and Herzl on the other. Herzl's Zionism came out of a deep rooted pessimism that basically we were oppressed and that it's going to get worse and worse and nothing you know because of the Dreyfus case. Nothing. Whereas the other two seem to be motivated much more by optimism, um, and and, and it, it, it was a much more hopeful kind of a, of a, of a, of a, of a Zionism. Yeah, it's a great point. And it's a great, uh, it's a great segue. Um, you know, historians would characterize the Zionism that we're talking about with Alkaline culture as uh, religious Zionism or messianic Zionism. Um, and it's, uh, it's proactive and it's sort of positive, affirmative um, and political Zionism, which we'll talk about next week when we talk about Herzl is um, reactive and responsive. And it says the current situation is untenable, you know, fill in the blank for whatever reason it is, the anti-Semitism and the Jewish question and the unsustainable nature of uh, Jewish presence in European countries where we're unwelcome. And we have to do something about it, right? But again, it's a reaction rather than something, uh, rather than something uh, proactive. And I actually wanna just pick up on that point and amplify it. Herzl was, you know, like writ large, let's just say Herzl was successful. Alkali and Kalischer were unsuccessful. I'll talk a little bit about the sort of qualified success of uh, Kalischer. 
but um, you know, there's a reason why you know every third grader has heard of Herzl and they've never heard of Kalisher and Alkali. What did they actually accomplish, right? How much, you know, like how many Jews moved to Israel because of them? Not that many. So part of the issue was a function of the timing, right? Until the 1880s and then 1890s and the turn of the century, we get to Kishinev. So, um, you know, Jewish life is okay, right? There's not this urgency. There's not this sense of we can't live in the pale of settlement anymore. It's not working, right? In the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, it's working, right? So, uh, you know, historians always look at, uh, at immigration patterns to tell you about um, what the quality of life is like in a given place, not just historians. You look at it, uh, you know, the data like in America, so the states people are moving to, the states people are moving from. It's a commentary on what life is like, right? If everyone's moving to California, I don't think they are, but if that would be the case, it would tell you there'd be something attractive about California. How many Jews are moving to Palestine in 1860? A thousand, five thousand, right? Once you get to the 1880s, it becomes the tens of thousands. So what changed? Right? So principally, what changed is uh, is the sense of uh, of urgency, the sense of safety, the sense of uh, uh, you know unsustainability of Jewish life in uh, in uh, Eastern Europe uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. So you know, absent that sense of desperation, absent that yeah. sense of urgency. Um, you know, the, the receptivity to the alkalis and the Kalishers of the world were much more, uh, were much more limited. Like, okay, I get the idea, but, you know, I, I'm not joining you in this uh, backwater in Palestine under the Ottomans to settle an unsettled land. Like, I can make it here in Kiev. Yeah, so, you know, besides the technicality of the Dome of the Rock kind of being in the way, was was there any talk at the time about the fact that, hey, we have to wait for the Mashiach to come? Or like, was that sort of a sidebar or did that not even come up? Yeah, it's a great uh, it's a great question. So it's part of a really long and protracted discussion. I'll just give you a couple headlines. So one is, you know, to uh, to argue against Kalisher, one is there's no obligation to bring a Korban if there's no temple. And if there's no uh, if there's no Mashiach, there's no temple, and so you put the cart before the horse. Even if you say there you could bring a korban before uh, before Mashiach comes, you have a whole host of problems, right? So where do you find a kohen? So the guy walks into the shul, says, "My name's Cohen, I'm a kohen." So does that qualify, or do you need to be a kohen miyuchas? You need to be able to trace your family lineage back to our own. Right, to be able to say, yeah, I'm a thousand percent sure I'm a Kohen. Somebody's not a Kohen and they do the Avod in the Beis Amikdash, that's a real problem. So where do you find someone who you can you know, be guaranteed is a, uh, is a Kohen? Where does the Mizbeach go? There's a spot where the Mizbeach has to be. You know exactly where that is. How do you know it's not two feet to the left or two feet to the right? right? So you're taking a big chance by building Mizbeach potentially on the, uh, on the wrong spot. Then you have another problem, which is uh, even if you had the Mizbech and you had a Kohen, Kohen needs to be in a state of Tara, needs to be in a state of ritual purity. Who's to say that's even possible to obtain in the absence of a paradum, in the absence of a red heifer? So there's a whole host of obstacles. It's not just like you can snap your finger. There's a reason. You know, the Ramban also lived in Jerusalem. He never thought of bringing a Korban, right? So, um, you know, there's a couple thousand years of Jewish history even though for the first hundred years after the temple, it seems like there may have been some interest or some uh, actual korban uh, uh, bringing. But putting that, uh, putting that aside, for a long, long time, right, no one had uh, dreamed of this, uh, of this uh, possibility. So it's not uh, for no reason that the overwhelming majority of you know, rabbinic authorities over the course of the past 2,000 years have not been keen on the reinstitution of, uh, of work. So, right, so it's, it, it strikes me, it really strikes me that the college gained so much traction in general anyway, because like I think today, somebody would be, someone like that would be regarded as a quack and wouldn't even make it out of the starting gate. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and in, in some ways, um, that that was the response. Meaning, I'll give you a few of the exceptions, but 
um, you know, most people were unmoved by his argument, um, including a lot of people that we, you know, think of today, like, you know, Rav Hirsch, the father of uh, Torah, you know, Torahim Derechetz, like, he wasn't interested in Zionism. So, uh, you know, right on down the list, like, the, it, it wasn't, you know, it's so obvious to us in the religious Zionist community in the 21st century, but it wasn't obvious to almost anyone um, in this period, especially pre uh, pre Herzl, and next week we'll talk about the reactions to Herzl. A lot of people thought he was a quack. Okay. So, in a lot of ways, this uh, you know was um, was kind of representative of what was to come one generation uh, one generation later. So, before we run out of time, I just I, I put together a list. I came up with nine nine examples of uh, of Kalischer's influence on kind of the Jewish uh, the Jewish world, and I'll just share them uh, very uh, uh, very briefly. Okay, so number one, um, in 1839, Kalischer began a correspondence with Montefiore. Uh, remember, I said that uh, he viewed these Gedolim, you know, Montefiore, Montefiore and Cremieu and, uh, and Rothschild as uh, agents in the divine plan. So uh, he, wrote to, uh, he wrote to Montefiore, and eventually uh, Montefiore did travel to Palestine. He didn't, uh, you know, purchase Jerusalem. But he did purchase land there, and he supported colonization efforts, and started the first Jewish orchard outside of uh, of Jaffa. Um, so you really could say that um, you know he succeeded on in making an impression on uh, on Montefiore. Um, and as one uh, scholar put it, uh, this is a quote from uh, Nachum Sakalo. He says Montefiore's outspoken love for Zion was largely due to Kalischer's suggestion. Okay, number one. Number two. There was a man called Chaim Lori, uh, who was contemporaneous, basically, with, uh, uh, with Kalischer. He also died uh, in the 1870s. Um, and uh, he was really responsible for forming the first society um, of its kind, which was called the Association for Colonization of, uh, of Palestine. He formed it in Frankfurt am Main in, uh, in 1860. And this was a um, this was like a pilot program. And uh, again, we'll talk more about it next week. But these kinds of societies began to spring up very gradually in the coming decades all over Europe. And uh, this was the first the first of its kind. Number three, number three, um, there was a man called uh, Karl Netter, um, who was really responsible for founding Mikvah Israel, the first agricultural school, the first agricultural society in uh, in Palestine. And it was really Kalischer's influence that uh, precipitated the founding of that uh, of that colony, of that uh, of that school. Number four, uh, the Malbim. When we learned about uh, you know nineteenth century commentaries on the Torah, we learned about uh, uh, Mayor Leibush, uh, the Malbim, um, and we actually have a letter. Maybe I'll just pull it up because it's so fascinating. Um, we have a letter that the uh, that the Malbim wrote. It's undated. So there's a book called Shivatzion. It's like a collection of, of letters that have to do with, um, you know, Zionism in like the early years. Uh, and it has this, uh, this letter from the Malbim written to uh, Tzvi Hirschkal, sure. And he says, uh, you know, all this uh, greeting and I wish you, uh, I wish you well. And we'll just pick it up. Um, he says in the uh, the fourth line, he says, Uvi kar Speaking about, you know, speaking to Kalisher in the third person, he says, you know, his ideas, your ideas are, are totally right. Uh, he says, according to my interpretation, I could support everything you've said, Rav Kalisher, based on the psukim, ki I agree with you that the redemption will come piecemeal, incrementally. Kishachar, nachon matzahu lech v'or ad nachon hayom, like like a sunrise. It doesn't just uh, happen in an instant. It takes uh, time before the night turns to day. V'shitzchila yitiyashev anashim ibnei Yisrael be'eretz Yisrael b'rishiyon malchei ha'aretz ha'yesharim b'chasidim v'yeh yeshuv eretz Yisrael kodem bi'as Mashiach. What you're saying is right. That based on the permission and the grants that we get from the important nobles of the world. We'll settle the land, and then Mashiach will come. And he says, and just like the pasuk says, "Chumashu kasu b'fer shishaya al pasuk b'terem tchila yelada." Umi ten v'yatale v'yalech hatzo b'yadav shi'azman lazeh es ratzon ukeis hinene dush b'avar rabav yaza 
Avas Olam, the Emir Tashem, Kesherut Li Hazman, Arif Divre Yedidi, Mayor Laibush Malbum, you know, and that uh, that moment should come in Heir of Yamenu when uh, we have the opportunity to return to the land of uh, to the land of Palestine. Number five, this is an interesting one. There's a man called Moses Hess. You know his book, Roman Jerusalem. Okay, uh, in um, uh, written, I, I don't have the date in front of me. I want to say in the 1870s. Someone will pull out the exact uh, date of publication. Um, so who was Moses Hess? Moses Hess was raised as an Orthodox Jew. He lost his interest in religion and became interested in uh, socialism and utopianism. And uh, at some point, because of anti-Semitism, took a renewed interest in, uh, in Judaism. And he started reading Kalischer. And he started corresponding with Kalischer. And uh, it, Italian nationalism was the model for him, uh, for him too. Um, he wrote, uh, you know, Rome and uh, uh, Jerusalem. And, um, uh, and he quoted, he quoted directly from Drishat Zion. Translations, uh, uh, I should have mentioned that Rishat Zion, a couple of years after it was uh, written in Hebrew, was translated into, uh, into German. Um, and Hess, he could have read the original because I think he had a yeshiva background, so he could have read the original in Hebrew, but he, he quoted it in German for his uh, readership because he wrote Roman Jerusalem in, uh, in German. Um, and uh, it bore directly on his, uh, on his philosophy. Um, you know, he was like the forerunner of labor Zionism. Uh, and I don't know if we'll have time to get to it uh, next week, but when, uh, you know, uh, Herzl basically wrote all of his uh, um, political um, and Zionist works, ignorant of the proto-Zionist uh, literature that had come before him. So when he finally got around to Roman Jerusalem, he says, oh my gosh, if I knew what uh, Hess had written, it would have saved me the trouble of writing Der Judenstadt. So you know, fascinating, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, line to be drawn from Kalischer to Hess to, uh, uh, to Herzl. Number six, there was a man called Eliyahu Gutmacher. Um, I have a quote for you. It's the, uh, the end of your source sheet. He says, um, who was another basically Zionist activist in, uh, in Europe. He says, it's an error to believe that everyone will live his life in the usual manner. And suddenly, one day the gates of mercy will open, miracles will happen on heaven and earth, and all the prophecies will be fulfilled, and all will be called from their dwelling places. This is not so, I say, and I add, that settling the holy land, making a beginning, redeeming the sleeping lands from the Arabs, observing there the commandments that can be observed in our day, making the land bear fruit, purchasing land in Eretz Israel to settle the poor of our people there. This is an indispensable foundation stone for complete redemption, right? The Kalisher could have written those words uh, himself. Number seven. Rabbi Yitzchak Elchanan Specter. Many of you have heard of Yeshiva University and its rabbinical school, of which I am a graduate, which was named for the most important and prominent Lithuanian posik of his generation, Rabbi Yitzchak Elchanan Specter, who died, I believe, in 1896 when the Ritz was founded, I think in 1897, correct me if I'm wrong about the dates. So it was named in honor of the Gadol Hadur who had just passed away. Yitzchak Elchanan Specter, okay? The undisputed leader of Lithuanian Jewry was so taken with Kalischer's proposal um, and, uh, and ideas that he actually proposed that uh, Jews all over Europe find a way to fund immigration to Europe. And what was the way to fund it? Everyone has a tenant, everyone has a landlord, whatever the rental agreement, donate 1% of the, of the lease to funding immigration to, uh, to Israel. Number eight, um, Rabbi Israel Hildesheimer, um, we know as the founder of the Hildesheimer Rabbinical uh, Seminary where Rabbi Young received his, uh, his smicha. Rabbi Israel Hildesheimer gave Kalisher his blessing. And I'll just uh, conclude with number nine, uh, Tzvi Pesach Frank in Jerusalem republished Rishat Zion in 1919 after, after the Balfour Declaration. He republished it and redistributed it to encourage Aliyah, right? So again, this is 50 years after Kalisher had uh, dreamed up his plan of what a return to Zion would look like. Some Jews had in fact returned to Zion in the tens of, uh, in the tens of thousands, especially in the 1880s and 90s with the massive uh, migration from, uh, from Eastern Europe. But just to think, right, he didn't write his own book about uh, you know, why Jews should return to, uh, to Israel. He just republished Trishat Zion because he thought 
right? This is the cat's meow. And if people just read Rishat Zion, they'll be convinced about why they should return to the land of, uh, of their fathers and precipitate the messianic, uh, the messianic age. So I apologize that uh, I have to run to Mincha and I'm going to stop, uh, I'm going to stop here.